You heard what Gil Barak of Colliers just said and how he characterized the uh, commercial or industrial space that, that you're here in part to talk about. Do you agree with what he said, that in other words, it's, it's healthy, uh, though maybe not as frothy as it was in the, in the pandemic years? I think that's a perfect characterization. At the end of 2023, we were at 5.5% vacancy nationwide in the industrial market. You know, that, that is a, a substantial increase from where we were at all-time record lows during the pandemic, but it's still well below the long-term vacancy rate for the industrial market. We're in a very healthy spot. Lisa, uh, uh, our, our producer, Jeanette Chen, was, was trying to explain to me the connection that you see potentially between uh, uh, commercial properties, industrial properties, excuse me, uh, and the crisis or the, the, the war in the Middle East and the, and the disruptions of shipping uh, in the Red Sea. Can you explain it to me? I'll do my best. <laughs> so what, what we have essentially happening now is geopolitics is supplanting economic efficiency as the primary driver of goods moving through the global supply chain. So what's happening in the Red Sea with the Suez Canal is actually coinciding at the same time that issues around drought-related conditions in the Panama Canal are essentially causing two critical arteries of trade to experience lots of disruptions. This is driving up maritime uh, transit times and costs. And a, a, a general kind of global instability in supply chains is in the long term further incentivizing a make or you sell paradigm in the United States and in partner countries. There are short term implications as well that we can talk through. But the, the biggest takeaway from what is happening in the Red Sea, what's happening with the Panama Canal, is this is yet another set of circumstances in uh, a, a long chain that we've seen over the past few years that is going to be driving more domestic manufacturing growth. And, and I think in 50 years' time, we're really going to be looking back at mm -hmm. this early 2020s moment as the, the dramatic moment where a, a shift in where goods are produced in relation to where they are sold takes place. Yeah, make where you sell. That's very interesting. And there are also incentives in some of the recent legislation, the IRA, uh, the CHIPS Act, and so forth, to do that, to revitalize uh, domestic manufacturing. I, I guess what I'm hearing you say in part is that, is that companies, whether they're manufacturers or, or retailers, whether it's a Costco or whatever, they don't want to get caught uh, with no inventory uh, because of disruptions in shipping, the supply chain disruptions. So they are, A, uh, buying from domestic sources where they can, and B, they're warehousing inventory so they're not caught without it. Am I right? You, you said it perfectly, and I'll add to that. The diversification of gateway ports of entry is really important here, and it's driving industrial demand uh, across the board. So, you know, uh, if, if shippers need to react reactively, I suppose, or proactively in terms of global supply chain disruptions, if you have logistics space in multiple port serving markets across the country, you are able to, to pivot and be able to bring those goods in and move them to your end consumer quicker. It's a good mitigation strategy.